sleeps, pal. Hey there, I'm Pete Townsend, and this is Money Never Sleeps. We look inside the minds of entrepreneurs and at the crossover of startups, enterprise, finance, technology, and life as we know it. This episode of Money Never Sleeps is sponsored by Pat Fintech, a training partner that demystifies fintech and digital finance for financial services professionals. Owen Fitzgerald and I are back with another Money Talk segment this week. We get into the story of Coinbase going public and the cryptofication of fintech. Get into Starling Bank's big investment from Goldman Sachs and what that might mean going forward. The credit building appeal of the latest Apple Card feature and buckets more on this week's episode of Money Never Sleeps. Money Never Sleeps, pal. Yo. <laughs> Yo. How you doing? Yo. How's it going tonight, dude? Pretty good. Pretty good. Uh, my son was 10 today. So we had a nice feast of uh, cherry bakewells and jam tarts and cakes there this evening. So I'm on a, I'm on a sugar rush at the moment. So we keep going with that it is all, <laughs> That is all kids need. But listen, big week last <laughs> week. Big week last yeah. week. Yeah. Yeah. We didn't get to the chat on the day, but uh, I know you were watching it closely with Coinbase. So... I you, was, are you, are you I was, out and we kept it. I'm holding, man, and <laughs> holding on for dear life. Still in, absolutely. H O T L, baby, hodl. But it, no, it's all good. So we had, obviously, you know this. We had our incident last week with our podcast machine that fell over. We read that intro. I don't know about seventeen and a half times before we just said, <laughs> "Screw it, we're done." Right? We're not. There was one time this. we just we're going to go. We're not going to immortalize it. Yeah, there was one time some. Some guy on some, on this side someone. of Dublin forgot to do that. Yeah, yeah, I don't know, but you know that that was like number seventeen anyway. So that was a straw that yeah. broke Owen's back. But I really did want to immortalize that on the day. I obviously took a bunch of notes. You know, kind of like Russell Carroll Kelly doing his tactics book, right? That <laughs> nobody's that interested in anyway. So I'm not going to go back through my trading diary of the day. But for those that didn't know, and I'm never surprised that folks aren't aware of this, that there is a massive digital asset player, cryptocurrency player called Coinbase. They went public on NASDAQ on the 14th of April. And the reference price of $250, I watched that skyrocket right up past my limit order that I put in of 365 for the small trade I did on Fidelity. Opened at 381 up to 429. And then I watched, this was the, the, the most awesome part for me as a fintech geek, right? And watching on NASDAQ.com, the COIN or coin symbol and the real time ticker of that price, power of equity markets and getting these kind of what's the word? It's not symmetrical. It's simultaneous. It's something that means everybody's getting the same information at the same time. Yeah, right. Yeah, I and I think that is symmetric. Right. But anyway, without looking up Webster's Dictionary. I watched as that price dropped down to 381, 379, 377, all the way down. And I'm thinking my limit order I put in at 365, it might come due. It might happen. And I had that set up my Fidelity app on my phone. And I'm watching on the NASDAQ.com website on my phone. And I'm waiting for something to happen. And as soon as I see it cross 366 down to 365 on the NASDAQ.com website, I get a ping on my phone that the Fidelity order at 365 was filled. I was like, that is just magical, right? And for me, that was kind of symbolic of the whole day that we've got crypto into public markets, but at the same time, we're bringing the benefits of public market price transparency and liquidity through to the crypto side, which was the real killer point for me. Massive amount yeah. of momentum, talked to a bunch of people, very surreal day, but it was awesome to witness in short. Yeah, and we mentioned it like last week. I mentioned it again. I, t I think one of the most, I suppose, important things about it is that, you know, th this is a company that's only nine years old, you know. What is it, only 11 years or something since Satoshi had his white paper out? Was it 2010 or was it before? Ended 2008, and then it was January 3rd, I think, 2009, that yeah. the first so, block was mined. So we're talking like 10 to 12 years for something to take cryptocurrency effectively mainstream, you know, is I think is incredible. When you think like how far we've come with typical bank products and even fintech, and yet you've something of this kind of magnitude happening in that short period of time. To me, in terms of what it means and what it uh, says about cryptocurrency and the interest and everything, I think it was incredibly kind of momentous occasion. Absolutely. Yeah, lots of, lots of good insights from some of the leading voices out there that I wanted to share. And just kind of zooming out a bit 
and one of the reflections on the All In podcast with the besties. So we've talked about this podcast before, the Jason Calacanis host with uh, Shamath and a few other guys. And they had Brad Gerstner on from Altimeter. Well, I'll mention later on as well, Altimeter, a big late stage private equity fund and hedge fund as well. And what Brad Gerstner said was that we're at the secular trend in technology and it's never been more potent. If you can hold an index of the top 30 technology companies in the world, you can hold on to them for five to 10 years. You will be incredibly well rewarded. It's the most asymmetric bet in all of investing history right now is to have a golden ticket with access to the best technology companies in the world today, right? And what he was basically saying was, listen, you guys all here on this podcast, you're so deep and so all in to this space. You guys have the most information. You are playing an unfair game and it's weighted towards you. Right. Because you have all of this information, all of this legal information, but all of this insight and you were putting tons and tons of money into the leading founders. Right. And, and the, the one of the comments that came out of this that I loved and I've repeated a few times in the last few days is gross tonnage of dollars. Right. That and that, that, that mean? altimeter's strategy is to put a gross tonnage of dollars, put the most amount of money that they can behind a behind leading founders and take them through every step of the way. Now they're getting in at late stage. So when they say every step of the way, they mean series D to series E, perhaps series F, and then to the public markets. But they've spent a lot of time honing their craft around companies going public, right? And how to help them and advise them to do that. When they put, you know, writing 50 to 60 to $70 million checks in these big late stage companies, they're like, listen, we're betting on companies going to two to 300 billion in valuation, right? And to see Coinbase now in those lights, right? Varying between 70 to 90 billion valuation in the public markets since last week, right? It's it's just mind blowing. And that for me is one of the big things here is just how much upside that we have left to go with all of this. Now, and it's interesting because like I said, I'm, I suppose, net positive on, you know, even though I might occasionally be a bit of a crypto skeptic, especially on the podcast yeah. when we're talking about it, but you know, I'm positive on digital assets and tokenization and a lot of these things that are still to be developed. I was listening to a really good conversation with Kara Swisher and Scott Galloway the other day. They were talking about Coinbase and, you know, what's the moat? What are they selling? If you're committed to crypto, Coinbase is effectively adding another kind of central player to what is supposed to be a decentralized world. But I think it's a fair kind of view. You know, what's, what's Coinbase given? It's the on-ramp into crypto. I suppose it's the way to describe it. I thought it was a really good way to describe it. There's going to be competition, but really, you know, these are the guys you could say are selling the picks and shovels at the gold mine, you know, and and that's what they're doing. They're providing a way for me or anybody else who has an interest to, you know, to access that and to do something about it. You know, an equivalent, I suppose, competitor is maybe the likes of a Robin Hood or something, you know, in the sense of what are they doing? They're providing wider access to the market to to do something with this. This episode of Money Never Sleeps is sponsored by Pat Fintech, demystifying fintech and digital finance for financial services professionals. Pat Fintech enable financial services professionals to transform their capabilities into the digital age with dedicated virtual training programs geared towards those that can develop, deliver, and monitor optimally customized user experiences balanced by appropriate governance, control, and oversight. To learn more about Pat Fintech, go to moneyneversleeps.ie slash P-A-T Fintech. I'm going to have to be careful here. (laughs) (laughs) Disclaimer warning. What you just said there, it's difficult for me not to respond on. And I don't think that I can, so I won't. But just kind of zooming out a bit. If you read the S1 of the Coinbase direct listing that was filed with the SEC, there's a lot of insights in there that point to a number of ideas that would suggest it's only just begun. Right. And, and it comes back to this, this fintechification of crypto or this cryptification of fintech that I was talking about last week that we never ended up getting onto the podcast. And my thesis on this is that if you think about the individual trade of cryptocurrency by an individual today, it is pretty much 100% digital or it is 100% digital from end to end. It's a truly digital process. If an institution wants to trade crypto, it's not 100% digital yet. Right. Now, if you then think about overlaying the individual value chain on top of the this institutional value chain with some gaps, 
that starts to get you, okay, that's going to be truly digital institutional finance. You then overlay that same mentality on top of wealth management, on top of institutional banking, on top of investment banking. That's where the upside really is, okay? And this is digitalizing finance rather than currencies, right? Which are two different things. And, you know, the Shamath, I, I looked at some of the numbers that he had been talking about where he said about the upside of fintech in that if you take away Stripe out of the top fintech unicorns, you're in the tens of billions in market cap. Now, I looked at those numbers and I looked at the top fintech unicorns and some of the the valuations are a bit outdated, but it was a lot more than tens of billions. It was actually closer to 300 billion. All right. And that's about 125 companies that are north of a billion valuation in fintech. If you look at the S&P 500 financials index, $4 trillion. Okay. And what we're saying is that those that are providing fintech propositions, whether they're tech or they're regulated financial services players operating as a fintech, that's a lot of room to grow from 300 billion up to 4 trillion. And that is just the US players, right? So I really see the entire, I see this all coming together. It may not happen, but that's where my bullishness is on this sector. And I absolutely, you know, the, the whole Coinbase relationship aside, I absolutely love this. I mean, I was wrecked, Owen, before I sat down at eight <laughs> o'clock tonight to take some notes to prep for this chat. And I just got so excited um, pulling it all so, together. I'm like... No, and the thing is, uh, obviously, we were going to talk about it last week and I sent you some texts today being like, look, we should talk about Coinbase business model. But like, and obviously, I'm not trying to put you in a position, uh, but I was, you know, people, I think, questioning the business as it stands now are missing the bigger picture. And it's it, it's exactly what you said. It's that we're at the beginning. So I can mm-hmm. say, oh, yeah, prices at X or whatever, and there's probably other competitors can do it cheaper. That's not the point. What they've done is made it mainstream. So even if you take it, and in some ways, Robin Hood is a good example of a comparable business, because what have they done? They've just brought that to the masses, you know, and the, the 13 million uh, extra users or whatever it was that kind of started trading stocks online in the middle of the pandemic and majority of them went through Robin Hood because they made it accessible. That's what Coinbase has done here. It's taken something that was still in its infancy to a degree and made a portion of it mainstream. And now it's okay for people to do this and talk about it, which then leads to the further kind of cryptification of fintech or whatever way we want to describe it. And I think to me, that's, exactly. like, that's the key point out of the whole Coinbase thing. It's, you know, it's short term to look at it now. And the funny, the other thing I'm going to think about was actually... Like if you look at it, like I said, in the space of nine years and where it's got to and it's hovering at the kind of, you know, anywhere between kind of 70 and 90 billion market cap. Like it just goes to show how much the banks have missed the boat here, especially the big U.S. banks like this. You know, they should have been mopping the floor with something. This shouldn't have been allowed to exist in their backyard in terms of an offering and to be able to build up a business like this. You mean from a from a regulatory perspective or a competitive perspective? I mean, from a competitive perspective, like they should, you know, uh, uh, Digital exchange shouldn't have been able to spring up, you know, and and effectively just take what seventy more market cap than the likes of Wells Fargo and some of these businesses. Um, I, you know, I, I just I just think they missed the boat here, and it, it's it's been it's been coming, and they still haven't moved, and you know they really missed a trick on it. Um, so. Yeah, one one of the ones that the other ones I'm watching is FTX. They're really interesting. They're the ones that got their name up on the Miami Arena for the Miami. Yeah, Arena, I saw that. Right? Yeah. That's Sam Bankman Freed heads up that group, but I know that he's invested a couple of companies that I'm close with. And shout out to Crypto Baz and our signal group. <laughs> they know who they are, right? So Crypto Baz gave me the FTX link to watch before Coinbase started live trading on NASDAQ because the pre-market shares were trading on FTX. And that was helping to fulfill my my jonesing to be able to see an actual <laughs> price live, even though that had yeah. been running for months before that, whatever, right? But so FTX are really interesting because they are a crypto exchange. They also list and enable trading of tokenized versions of public equities and pre-public equities like Coinbase before it went public. But they've got Tesla, MicroStrategy, Amazon, Apple, whatever. So CryptoPaz said, listen, one of the guys said, do you, re- do you guys reckon there'd be a dump in BTC once this is live, i.e. the Coinbase direct listing? And CryptoPaz came up with all cryptos do a pullback. But a lot of people are thinking the same. So no, it will probably head upwards, which it did, <laughs> which it right? Did. Right up to 64,000. Now it's back down to some more normal levels. But CryptoPaz then came up with Bitcoin is the fastest asset to hit $1 trillion in history and surpassed the value of the British pound 
as a number six world currency. So he said, Pete, that's a few sound bites for the podcast, Bitcoin Never Sleeps. <laughs> so I, I got him into crypto about five years ago. He thought I was some big crypto whale. I've known him for you know 20 years now. He's a good friend. Yeah. But just kind of closing that part out, I Simon Taylor from 11FS put this tweet up from Sam Bankman Freed at FTX. And it was on the day, on the 14th last week. He said, today an exchange will list an exchange. One of them operates 24-7 lists innovative assets, allows users to onboard, has a mobile app, website, and an API, and made $1 billion last quarter. The other one is NASDAQ. Yeah. Right. And he basically said, we said, you know, point two, congrats, Coinbase. This is just the beginning. Yeah. Right. So. That's it. Yeah. yeah. Like that's spot on, in fairness. Chills down my spine, you know, kind of walking through this. And fintech is fintech. And so many people kind of when you say that, think you're talking about consumer fintech and apps on a phone. But to me, it's a digitalization of finance, yeah. right? Oh, yeah, a lot more to come. Speaking of flying, Starlink, right? Starlink Fly, Starlink Bank, they secured a 50 million pound investment from Goldman Sachs, talking about gross tonnage of dollars, right? Or gross tonnage of pounds in this example. And the money that they're bringing in is tabbed for the European expansion, right? And we'd love to see Ireland go first in that. And we definitely need it with Ulster Bank and KBC now pulling out. And the Irish nation basically left with three banks to choose from, bar the credit unions, right? The cap table of Starling Bank now has Goldman Sachs, Fidelity, Millennium, which is a big hedge fund, Marion Global Investors, which is now Jupiter. Shout out to Paul Noonan. The Qatar Investment Authority. 2 million customers now, and they're about to turn their first annual profit with deposits now north of 5 billion pounds. They're doing well. And still kind of, I would say, under the radar as much as you can when your founder has like a best-selling book and uh, you're making headlines all the time. But still, you know, slow and steady as opposed to Revolut. That makes a lot of noise. And I hear like they were looking to launch in China was their last announcement and stuff like this. It seemed very much a spray and pray. Whereas Sterling is, every announcement has been very positive. Everything is tipping along very well. You know, they're getting to profitability. They're adding customers. They're adding important investors. All very positive for what they're doing. And look, I think Europe is a, is a real opportunity for them. Massive. Yeah, it's big, big opportunity for them. You're right. It's compared to some of the other players out there. Like you said, grow the business smartly, grow the business slowly, but don't be afraid to race ahead. There was one point in the last few years where Ann Bowden said, listen, we need you to get X thousand small business accounts in the next number of months, right? And the team went out and got them. And having that diverse customer base of individuals across a couple of different generations, right? From millennials through to, what are we, what am I, Gen X? Yeah. I always forget what I am. I'm not a boomer. Simon Taylor was given out to boomers in his newsletter the other day. And I'm like, yeah, I'm not a boomer. Don't worry about it. Are, do boomers read your newsletter, Simon? But like I said, going to turn their, their first profit this year, right? So please come to Ireland first, get that done, use that as the base of European expansion. But as with anybody, the path into Europe is hard, right? You get it right in, in, in the English language, and then you got to go into German, into French, into Spanish, into Portuguese, into Italian, into Swiss German, right? I could go on and on. Did I say Dutch? No, we didn't get there yet. But that's easier said than done, right? I, I've seen, you know, in working with Olivia, who I'm a, a non-exec for here in Ireland, you know, they started out with their first incantation, their first version of their app was in Portuguese, right? And when they came to the Irish market, not only did they need to change the language, but also change the context, right? They had done a bit in the US market first, and they said, listen, here's how you're gonna save on your groceries. That won't fly in Ireland, right? Still the English language, but you gotta say, this is how you're gonna save on your shopping. Yeah, small things, but important, and stuff that takes time. Yeah. Absolutely, and that when it's the user experience in your face on your phone, you kind of want that to be right, so. Well, but I do um, think I do think that uh, like Starling's USP or the reason they're, they've done so well has been the focus on the business side. And I think that mm. actually makes it easier to build a customer base across Europe because the majority of those businesses, any sort of SMEs or anyone is doing some sort of sales, you know, outside of their market and would have a need. So, you know, you look at the revolutes and everything and yeah, they were really valuable and really good for kind of 
personal customers at the start and you're traveling and everything and that's great but actually like the long-term value is in having the business customers building up that base and i think that's where you know i think that's what's stood them so well uh, so far and i think that's what will help them expand across europe that's a good point in that thinking about how they continue to move up the curve past smes into mid-sized corporates right and start providing services for them, start providing lending, revolving credit, all those types of things, right? Like I was talking about before, moving up the value chain of digital, right? And that, yes, you can get the individual experience, right? They've done really well in getting the SME experience, right? Because it is 100% digital. They have no branches. You, You know, you can't go fill out a form anywhere. When you move that into corporate banking and massive lists of authorized signatories to and A, B signatures and all those types of things, there's a lot more to do there. And there's a lot more demands on your apps to build that out. But that'd be really interesting to see and really interesting to ask Ann Bowden about at some stage. Yes. Her mindset on expansion by geography or expansion by segment, yeah. right? Some segments what? will be fairly specific to, to geography or they won't do much outside of the market. So maybe you want to go by segment, you know, and so that you're, you'll work with the segments that you know will be across the EU. Yeah. You start getting into some of the supply chain stuff, right? In banking, those that are suppliers and customers together across different parts of a manufacturing value chain. And it doesn't need to be big, massive MNCs, huge industrials. It can just be those working on, you know, a a smaller supply chain that I'm sure our friend Brian Norton from our first episode ever. Absolutely. Yeah. Supply finance. I'm sure he'd be interested it. in yeah. getting into that conversation now, right? Yeah. I just talked to him last week actually. Uh, it was good to catch How him. is he? He's doing great. Yeah. So we're in the States at the moment. So we're having a good time. Business awesome. is going well. But yeah, and as well. Okay. No, I, I, this is interesting now. This is interesting. On, I think you're spot on there because if you think about it, those types of businesses, even supply or logistics types of companies, they tend to follow their clients. They don't have a geographic kind of focus. They just go where their clients need them. So if you take the same approach to it and say, well, you know what, we're going to focus on these particular types of clients or, you know, the manufacturing supply chain. And we'll work with those companies and we know that they need to be in these 10 countries. So we'll make sure we have solutions that work on the ground in those countries. Let's not look at going country by country, you know, and opening up new offices everywhere. We'll say we're going to work with all these types of businesses and these are the markets they're going to be concentrated in. Yeah. Yeah, this kind of hits home now for me as well, because a couple of years ago, geez, actually it was three years ago now that I first started working with Greg Chu from QPQ. A shout out to Greg. And a lot of the core part of some of the first concept we were talking about with the QPQ business, which is a deep tech platform here in Ireland with global ambitions. And a lot of the initial conversations were around supply chain. And it was just from where Greg had come from, going back to helping mango farmers in Africa move up the curve from netting the equivalent of a dollar per bushel up to $7 per bushel just by managing the supply chain smartly. And so much of some of those original ideas were around the consolidation of data across the supply chain, across customers and their suppliers, right? And there's a long way that you can go with the digitalization of finance to, yeah, no, this is this is much bigger than I thought it was going to be. <laughs> But yeah, it'd, it'd be cool to get someone like Anne on to talk about, you know, the, the plans or to understand that, because I'd love to see how, how far or how close we are to the mark in terms of how how someone would try scale a business like that across Europe. Exactly. And the world is their oyster. That's the thing, because, you know, there's not many others that are well positioned to do this, yeah. where it is a fully digital bank that now has the bones to address mid-sized corporates, you know, with moving up, moving up the curve. Okay. Watch this space. Watch this space. Absolutely. I know there was another thing that you were interested in this evening that I only heard about this morning briefly, and I didn't look too deeply at it, but it was the Apple 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 Card family option now. Tell us about that. Yeah, so... I, and I, it only kind of I saw it on TechCrunch yesterday, and actually I see the link you have sent me is the same link I have open here where I'm reading up. On oh, it. good. What what I suppose was interesting about it is just you know the backstory here is that Apple and Goldman were had been accused of some kind of gender bias around their Apple Card and the, how they were assessing the credit of people applying for it. And they seem to be more heavily favoring males in terms of how they were making assessments. So that had been looked into and there was a lot of kind of legal discussions going on in the background. And they got cleared anyway of any wrongdoing on 
both sides only in the last month. And then as part of obviously their big announcement this week, in there was reference to kind of Apple Card and this kind of Apple Card family, which is really interesting for a couple of reasons, because primarily it allows a person and their spouse to kind of jointly build a credit score. So the credit score for the card is shared across both partners. And like there's hundreds of, or hundreds, there's probably thousands or millions of couples whereby one will have a better credit score than the other. And that obviously impacts on, you know, plenty of things that you'd be applying for. This allows you to effectively lean on the other person to jointly build up your credit score on the back of it, which is a really interesting concept. You're seeing seeing a bit of it with, there's a number of startups, particularly in the US, that are trying to build kind of these uh, credit cards that allow people to build their credit uh, score on the back of it, which is interesting. But then it also then is, with Apple Card, it allows the, with the one card, it allows family members to use it. So kids over the age of 13. So what really kind of struck me about it was, I know I have Rev, a Revolut account, two of my kids have the cards, you know, and I just top it up and manage it. But like when you think, and you've probably come across as much, them as much as I have, there's lots of companies, you know, in the startup space going after personal financial management cards and solutions for the teenage market, uh, the younger market, and then also coming out with credit card solutions. And this to me, you know, this this was a is a potentially a big blow to those types of companies when you have a company the scale of Apple and you know another kind of just we've talked about this before they're just able to make small changes to what they're already offering and already they can they have a massive customer base that'll avail of it. Why would I then want to start continue using you know a credit card from some startup that's mm-hmm. helped me build my credit score when I already have all my Apple products? Yeah, and where your most your volumes going through exactly you know? and the more and more and more integrations of apple pay not into even retail point of sale but in online yeah and then it gives you the option because it's long been talked about that you know what apple will possibly start doing with their high-end products the new iphones the new macs and stuff is that they'll start having them on this kind of subscription model and obviously shout out again to to prof g for his uh, recurring revenue bundle model but he's long kind of flagged it that all apple has to start doing is allowing people to pay a monthly subscription to get early access to the next iPhone, you know, and I get it ahead of time. But if you, if I'm paying a subscription and I have an Apple card that, you know, there'd probably be a way to add that feature into the card so that my, me meeting my subscription payments every month help build up my credit. And you can see how within that ecosystem, all of a sudden, from a financial services point of view, my credit score is building up, the products I'm getting offered are starting to build up, there's more and more of them. And then you can see why, like we talked about a few weeks ago with Revolut as to how difficult it is for them to go into the US market. But sure, they're competing with the likes of an Apple card. They're not competing with the banks as such, they're competing with the Apple cards and the Square and Cash App and these sort of things. And that's a matter like the... You know, culturally, like the Cash App is another good example with Square, like, the, you know, it's mopping the floor with the banks even in terms of from a culture point of view and the people using it. And same with Apple Card. It's incredibly difficult if that's your competition versus the traditional bank model. Yeah. And and the banks becoming just pipes, rails. That's it. That's it. Like, what, what, you know, what are Goldman getting out of the Apple Card? Well, they're, they're getting the, you know, the, they're providing the plumbing in the background, ultimately. I wonder if they're getting the data. Now, anonymized. Yeah. Absolutely. But that is powerful data to have when you've built a savings and investing app like Marcus. Yeah. Right. So that's a wonderful crossover because that is technically what Olivia do is that they look at your spending patterns and they try to figure out the best way for you to invest, for you to save, right? Based upon what they know about what you're spending. And yeah, when you're doing that on the scale of Marcus, that is magic. Right, doing that on the scale of Apple Card, that is magic. Oh yeah, and that's it. Like it, it's you know, it's small announcements, but when you put them in the context of the scale that mm. they have, like it's incredible the the impact it'll have from a financial services point of view in in the U.S. market by just that small update to you know an existing product. Yeah, and, it, and it's so funny, even like thinking back to the Coinbase conversation, is that we know nothing. Yeah. Right. I I publicly know nothing. Right. <laughs> about where this is all headed. But in the same way that a fly in the wall in that boardroom of Coinbase versus the fly in the wall in the boardroom of, of Apple and Goldman, you know, th- they're thinking three, four, five years ahead of this. Absolutely. Right? What, they're, what they're doing, the, the announcements they're making now, their executives had closed the book on a year ago. Like, 
hey, we're moving on to the next thing. Team, please take this forward. Get it done, right? So they're already you know, so yeah, a couple of years like in said, the future. It wasn't a big announcement, but like I said, when I, when I looked at it from the context of the scale of what it could potentially do, I was like, you know, this is a big deal, especially in light of the, you know, when you talk about Revolut and its challenges going into that market, only because we talked about it recently, I was like, you know, this, this is why they can't compete. And a couple of minutes ago, Owen, you said the phrase recurring revenue bundle. Is there another way to say that? Yeah, uh, I think it's called a rundle, Pete. I may have mentioned it before once or twice. Oh, <laughs> oh, a what? A rundle. <laughs> Rundle. Oh, yes. Yes, we have talked about Rundles before, haven't we? I, Shout out to I, I Doug Rod. Love, yeah, I'd love to say that I own, I can own the, the, uh, the copyright or the trademark on that one, but I can't, unfortunately. No, you can't. And, and again, shout out to Doug Rogers in Pittsburgh who picked up on us saying Rundle. And yeah, anyway, yeah, that see, that's what I love about this is that it's these little stories that get you thinking. And it'd be pretty cool to think that sometimes we're right, you know, with where this is all headed. And you know what, what I find is that it allows, obviously in light of the job I do and the job you do, it allows me or it provides some kind of context and bigger picture in terms of when I'm then working with clients. So I have, I have a company recently doing something really interesting in the e-commerce space and they were talking about partnerships and I was talking to them about future product features and then we got thinking about, well, you know, they're, they're working with e-commerce firms, SMEs, selling online, maybe virtual debit cards would be something that could be a potential next product offer and i also have a company that work i work with another company who does that so putting the two of them together but like it wasn't their next immediate product step or the next thing on their roadmap however it's like okay well you know in terms of all the things that are constantly going around in my head around where this is all going you know this could be something that could be brought forward and be far more valuable in terms of where they thought it might be so yeah no it, that's it that's what you, you, it's a thesis owen it's your thesis on the world and on the view, your view of your own subject matter expertise and where your passion is and what gets you going, right? And when you form that thesis, you start to identify things like Russell Crowe in A Perfect Mind. Now, he was a sociopath, right? And we're not. <laughs> At least the jury's still out. But yeah, that's, that's the point. When you have a thesis on things, you start to identify the trends, you start to see the outliers, and you're like, okay, we know where this is going. Right. And it's 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 honing your craft. And that's why that's why we do this. Right. One of the other stories that I prepared for last week's episode when the great podcast machine fell over was Plaid raising four hundred and twenty five million dollars in their Series D from Altimeter as it charts a post visa future. And I was like, who the hell? Our altimeter, because I hadn't been familiar with him. I think so. I looked at it and it's Brad Gerstner, who was on the All In podcast with Shamath and Jason Calacanis and the other guys and talking about gross tonnage of dollars. Yeah, 425 million Series D. Altimeter didn't fund all of that, obviously. Ribbit Capital were in there as well. Our friends that are partnering with Walmart on their super fintech app, makes right? That makes sense. <sighs> Man, all this stuff is connected. All of this is connected. It's it's absolutely fabulous. Okay, cool. Anything else on your mind uh, this no, fine I'm, eve? No, uh, actually, you know what? One of the things we were going to just briefly touch on last week was uh, obviously Bernie Madoff passed away and uh, brought up a lot of the stories and like it, it kind of shined a light again on that period and everything he did. One of the articles I was reading, it was in the Wall Street Journal, was actually the fact that his entire scheme, and I think it was through Bank of America, was he had two business accounts. That was it. All of the money that went in and out, the principal and everything that came in from investors, came in through one of the accounts. At one point, he had as much as $5.5 billion in it. And I, I just, you know, I was like, Jesus, I couldn't get my head around that as to, because obviously I've, I've worked in banks, like, you know, worked on the corporate banking side in a couple of places. You know, you have checks and balances in place around, you know, money flows in and out of accounts and stuff like that. Like, Literally two accounts and the money was just coming in and out. It was up as high as five and a half billion. I just found that in the scheme of what you assume was a complicated financial dodgy scheme that he was putting together. And yet it was like literally two business accounts. That was it. I was in the middle of the wild west of hedge funds in 2000 to 2006 when all this stuff was happening. And there was a number of hedge fund managers that would not segregate things like this. And there was always an audit around it. And there was always checks and balances and always ways to make sure that things work. There were exceptions to the control processes that people put in place. But this one, this he got away with it. I just found that, um, that particular fact was bizarre. There's things that I can't say on air that I know <laughs> about this stuff. When I first saw the news of what Madoff was actually doing, I'm like, yep, yep, get that. 
totally see how it can, that can be done. Yeah, yeah. Totally see how that can be done. And he's had a terrible life since then. Don't speak ill of the dead is what I would say. Yeah. You know, and I'll leave it at that. But no, he's that. W- that was a difficult one for a lot of people out there who lost a tons, gross tonnage of dollars again. Yeah. Actually, yeah. another another interesting thing because one of the podcasters listening to it kind of drew attention to it. Despite all of the obviously what happened, they did manage to recover something like thirteen point seven billion. They did, which is is quite an achievement. And the guy obviously responsible and managing that team for getting all that money back, you know, deserves a huge amount of credit for being able to do that. Often, yeah. you know, you see stories even far on a far smaller scale in the Irish press and stuff about money being lost and like nobody gets anything back. Like, you know, that's an incredible amount of money to be able to return to people. I know. Well, I think, I think it was, I think I still got the notes here that I left behind. Let's see. It was, it was Bernie Madoff. No, I just deleted him. Anyway, I think it was 14, 14 billion out of something like 65 billion that the collective shareholders altogether were purported or at least led to believe that they owned. So they got back a nice chunk, which isn't easy and apparently harder to do these days to trace that money than it is to trace crypto. <laughs> really? um, <laughs> so shout out to Chainalysis. I know those guys do a great job with tracking, tracking crypto. And did you, have, did you, did you have any other uh, interesting stories? No, it was just, we're talking a lot about Shamath, yep. Jason Calacanis on this episode, like we're like we know them <laughs> i know it's first <laughs> we don't you know, someday Obviously, soon hopefully we'll have jason calacanis on the show yeah fingers crossed and we, we shout out to now dennehy who connected us with jason calacanis and, and we'll see if we can get that done but you know i was i was concerned about how much ink i was giving to shamath and didn't want as if jason would ever listen or actually mind or care that shamath was getting you know more shout outs than him on this podcast but jason just so you know i have read your book angel loved it it was brilliant I built a lot of that into how I look at companies and how I think about companies uh, and also signed up for your angel university class next week that Martin Cass, shout out to Martin. I know he's a listener. We know he's a listener that Martin Cass suggested I have a look at. It's only $250. All of that goes to charity. So I'm going to, uh, you, well, I've heard it's a great what? course from Martin. So I'm going to check it out next week. Do you know what? It, it, it's, there's obviously Shamath and the likes of Jason and a few others that we kind of name drop regularly. But I suppose for me, what attracts me to, to listening to those people is that they have conviction. And, you know, Shamath totally. publicly has massive conviction in certain areas. He's behind a lot of the SPAC investments. Um, and similarly with Jason at the uh, from an angel point of view. And that to me, like, you know, they have a thesis. They follow it through publicly. They put their money behind it. And that, you know, similarly with Scott Galloway, he has very strong views on certain markets and certain things, but, but they're very well grounded in his research and the logic and the future of where things are going. So it's really interesting to see how a lot of their, their announcements and their statements are playing out. Yep. And that, that's the best thing about being able to listen to some of these guys and, and women on podcasts is that you can hear the conviction in their voice. Yeah. You aren't just reading a book. Now you can get it, the book read to you on Audible or whatever, right? But actually listening to them speak and have conversations with individuals, that's a power of the podcast medium, which as with digital finance, we've only just begun. That's it. Final final piece, actually, I should mention. We did, we passed, we've over, we're 202 subscribers to the newsletter now which is great. So we passed 200 without me realizing, because actually for anyone who, who subscribes to it, I haven't written in the last few weeks. I had a bit of a creative block. I've like seven, I've, last time I counted, I've seven things that are three quarters written and I can't uh, figure out how to finish any of them. But I'm getting there. So I'll be back uh, back at it from Monday. There'll be a new one out Monday. But yeah, 200, over 200 now subscribers, which is great. So I awesome. Start, and start. I've had more subscribers when I haven't been writing. So I don't know if that says something. But well, yeah. you know what? There's, we've got this little thing called a email subscription collector going on on our Money Never Sleeps website. And there are at least another five or six, maybe even 10 that I have to move over to the oh, Substack list that nice. we collect there. So we're well over 200 now, which okay. is good. Well, then in that case, so, I will be top priority now, get that back out every every week or two weeks from Monday. So for anyone that's, for anyone that's been missing their, my random thoughts, uh, they'll be back next week. Oh yeah. Loads of good names on this list. I wish I could read them out. Just new ones, a good 10, one, 10 new ones, that just folks that you and I I think I've talked to in the last uh, couple of Brilliant. weeks that Brilliant. have have signed up for it now, which is awesome to see. So there we go. Awesome. Well, I think we'll leave it there for tonight, Mr. Fitzgerald. Absolutely, Mr. Townsend. It's been a pleasure as always. Yeah. I'll check you later. <laughs> Take it easy. That does it for this week, folks. And you can learn more about the stories we covered in the show notes on our website, moneyneversleeps.ie. 
So check us out online and subscribe to our weekly Money Never Sleeps newsletter as well. Also, thanks to Conan Brophy from Create Sound for mixing and editing this episode. Conan is an excellent media man to get in touch with when you're thinking about launching your own podcast. As for me, I'm the founding partner at Norio Ventures, and I'm an early stage startup advisor and investor focused on fintech and digital assets. If you'd like to talk to me about your business, drop me a voicemail on moneyneversleeps.ie. Finally, till next time, thanks for listening. See you.